Okay. Uh, I have two talks. I still, at the last minute, deciding which one. <laughs> so, I'm going to give the least rehearsed, crazy version, and we'll see how that goes. Following along with uh, Jay's typing as we go. Uh, let's make a let's make a website. So, um, I want my website to just say hello for now. Um, that's really not it, right? My website is just a program that prints hello. So I'm going to need a library uh, for the web server. It's called web server servlet, and the reason it has that name is uh, I'm going to write a dynamic website. It's, it's going to run some code every time someone hits it. My code is going to be boring. It's just going to say hello every time. But um, you know, in principle, I could read some files and import something. And that gives me serve slash servlet. Servlet means one of these programs that run when it gets a request, and that program is represented as a function. So here's Lambda again, uh, and I will get some requests that will include things like, um, you know, there were there were queries in the in the, uh, in the URL, things like that. Okay. We're almost there. If I try this, um, then it tries to run, and we get an error. The error message says that the string hello is not a legal kind of response. So let me go fix that. It's because, what does hello mean? Is that literal text to show up? Web server crash. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's, uh, it's coming. Okay. <laughs> Actually. Um, <laughs> Does it mean the literal string hello, or should I put HTML in there, or some other kind of data? So we have to be a little more specific, and I'll be more specific when it comes back. Right, here we are. Um, I'm going to say that I'm going to construct a response as an X expression. Now, X expression you can think of as uh, the X comes from XML. HTML is not exactly an XML, but it's, you can squash it in most of the time. So we'll use that, and it's a kind of parenthesized variant where literal strings like hello mean literals. And to get that, I need to import this web server HTTP X expert. So that gave me a response X expert. And uh, if you remember to kill the server off every time I try to run it. Okay, there we go. We got the string hello. Okay, have we got that piece over? Okay, so that was just some library stuff. What if I want that hello? You know, it's kind of boring. Let's make it bold. It's the best way to make a web website better. How do we make it bold? <laughs> I could try like this. Okay. And some of you know that's not going to work because I've already told you this is meant to be literal. So it's not HTML. So uh, we just got the, the angle brackets there in the output. The way that you make something bold, the way that you use the B tag in this notation is that we make a list. It has a literal string in there, but we put this quote B in front. Okay. Um, how many people already know what a symbol is? And for this team, well, yeah, about half of you, that's fine. So a symbol is just like a string. So you just, everybody knew what I meant when I said string hello, right? The symbol is almost the same thing. You just put a quote mark on the front and not at the end. And so what's the point? Well, um, the point here is that I saved a character. <laughs> uh, but I think more characters when I do more things. So, uh, when I say list hello, obviously that puts a symbol hello in the list. And I can pull it back out at first. Um, what if I put a quote mark in front of a number like 12? Uh, then it doesn't do anything to the number. Or it doesn't do anything to a string. What if I put it in front of a uh, parenthesis though? Then, that gives me a list, and it makes a list for me. So it's an even shorter way of writing a list. Okay, so that's a list containing one, or a list containing hello, or if I leave off the quote marks here, that's a list containing the symbol hello. So the quote mark kind of distributes over everything inside the parentheses in addition to make a list. So it's a convenient way of writing short and you know, list compactly. In particular, if I say list quote be hello, 
we like the shorthand so much. That's the default way that this print in this world. So it's uh, quote me hello. That means a list containing the symbol be followed by the string hello. So that's what I mean by this this being a kind of parenthesized XML because you just put a quote mark on the print. And it's like putting B with a, you don't have to spell out B at the end, you just put a close parenthesis. So this time I'll do what we expected. Okay, it's bolder, as you can tell. Uh, maybe we should do more kinds of styles so that you can see it better. So uh, I could use div, and now I want to set the style so I can change the color to blue. So I want to have a style attribute, and the way we do that is we, uh, we introduce parentheses right after the tag name as a symbol to say this is a set of attributes, and then we use attribute names as symbols like style, and then the attribute values we put strings in there because, uh, as in this case, it's got spaces and all sorts of things inside. So you can read this as, well, let's see, I can read it actually, I'll show you in the web browser. So when you read it, we put hello in blue because when we Okay, so that was just another notation for this kind of thing. I just return that as a literal. Everyone still with me? So, we can make a list with that quote shorthand. There's another thing we can do, which is, uh, it's maybe a little hard to see. Do I need to make the font bigger? Or? This is a back quote. So this is a regular apostrophe kind of quote. This one is going the other way. When we do that, it seems to behave the same way. Um, or in a one, two, three. But what it also does is let me use a comma to escape back into the expression world. So it's like quote, except there's escape, this escape written with a comma, which I'll pronounce unquote usually. Uh, and so uh, sometimes I pronounce the back quote as quasi quote, because it's kind of like quote, except you can escape. So if I wanted to. Um, if I wanted to say print the current time in seconds here, then I could escape and do current seconds like that. Mm -hmm. So that'll print hello in the space in the current seconds, except that's a number and I need a string for it to be some literal text. So I'll convert the number to a string. Okay. Just make sure that worked right. No, it didn't. You still took out the other code. Okay, then I did not change to back. So now that it's a back quote, you can see I did some weird things because there was angle brackets in my name, number to string, and so uh, there we go. So it's okay. So um, what you're seeing here is something that looks kind of like code, but it's got a quote mark in front of it, and so it's actually data. And there's this whole list idea that you can view code as data or kind of go back and forth between. Them. So we're going to keep playing on this theme, but build up the modern machinery on top of this uh, that, that you see in Racket, especially, um, and to some degree in other schemes as well. Um, the, the bad thing about this, I'm just going to simplify it back to here. The bad thing about viewing this as data instead of code is what if I mis mistype style? What's going to happen now? Uh, I don't get an error when I run this program that says a hey, style is unbound or something. You must use the wrong name. Uh, I just kind of got lost. <coughs> it happens that um, you know it's in there as an attribute, but it doesn't mean anything to the web browser. Or what if I spell it correctly, but I leave off these square brackets? Then something similar happens. It, it happens that style is a tag that the web browser ignores. It doesn't show you the content of it. So I want to I want to prevent that kind of thing, and I would like it more to be a syntax error. But I catch this before I even try to run the program. So I could dynamically check this. I could add something around this that says check form and make sure that the kind of thing I, I put there is okay. And that's just more list and tree types of programs like Jay was showing. Well, what I want to do instead is make this code like this, no quote mark in the front. And they construct a similar kind of list that works as an S expression. But It'll be able to tell me if style is misspelled or something like that. So I want to extend the language with this new div form. Can I write div just as a function? 
And if it was a function, what would it take as an argument? It's got some attributes and then the content. And it would do div and then the attributes and the content, something like that. Okay, but um, you can already see it's going wrong here. What happens when I try to run that? It's because style is not, square brackets are the same as parentheses. So it's trying to apply the style function and style is not even defined. I could choose a different syntax and squeeze it into function notation if I want. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that I really want to write it this way. Because what I'm going to be talking about in, for the rest here is, you know, fundamentally you want some notation so the programmers can read it better. And whether this one's actually better or worse, I'm going to set aside, but let's suppose that I've determined that this is a better notation that I'll write uh, clearer and, and more checkable programs if I don't put it there. So that means I, I can't write it as a function. I need to write it as a macro. Um, I can make a style function, but then I've got an extra set of parentheses here. Uh, the encoding is not going to work out very well. So what I need, with the way I should think about this is div is not a function. It's a new piece of syntax. But it's a new syntactic form. And uh, this new syntactic form only works when I spell style correctly and have the right parentheses. Uh, so it's not defined. It's going to be defined syntax. Now the big question is what to put here. What to put after that. So I need to define something that can take this, take this thing that's in my program, and convert it to this kind of thing. I need to transform something of this shape into this shape. And I'm going to do that, but how am I going to do that? It turns out I can do this by introducing a compile time function. So define syntax here introduces a compile time binding, right, or macro expansion binding. And it's going to get some argument that we often name STX for syntax. It's going to get this representation of the program. And what it should produce is a representation of this program. So how can we represent these two pieces of our program? Well, we could put a quote in front of that and pass it in as the argument. Right? That is a piece of data now that we can construct a compile time. And then we could get the result back uh, as this thing with the code in front of it and drop that back in place. So that's the, the code is data connection here. And that's in fact the way they did things in the old days. But it's going to turn out that this is not uh, quite what we're going to do. We're going to put an extra hash there. And the extra hash is something like a list, but it's a list with some extra structure embedded into it. It's called a syntax object. So let me talk about syntax objects. Uh, here we have... Um, so this is meant to be a REPL, just like at the bottom of Dr. Record. Right? If I have x by itself, then that's a reference to the variable x, and of course it's not defined. And I can define it. And now x is fine, but when you have an x with no quote marks, it's referencing a variable or something. It's, it's an expression, a piece of code. And if I put a quote mark on it, the whole thing, quote x, is a piece of code. But the x itself is just a symbol. And so if I evaluate it, then I just get that symbol back. Uh, there's a kind of connection between this symbol x and the code, the variable x. And it turns out there's this thing called a val that bridges, takes those. It takes the data x, uh, treats it as code, or it evaluates it, and then um, that's why it gives me that thing. I and X10 and try that again. Okay, there you go. I'm not saying you should use a vowel. <laughs> but it's helpful to have a vowel here as a little reminder of that bridge. Syntax objects are very similar. So here I've got hash code X. When I hit return, we don't get just hash code X back um, because it's showing us that in fact there's a little more information. It's not only that it's the syntax object X, but it, that it was at line one, position four. And it's four characters over it. Um, and uh, there is a connection between the syntax object X and the symbol X that I can get from one of them to the other using syntax E hash code X. So syntax E is an operation that pulls the symbol X out of the syntax object hash code X. So it throws away the source location information and some other information as we'll see. 
facility. Right? And I haven't really explained why we need this extra layer um, over syntax object, over, over S expressions. But just to, to talk a little bit more about it, if you have plus one two, that is a function call by the plus function. This is a list containing the symbol plus and uh, one and two. This is a syntax object that contains a similar structure inside of it. It's a syntax object that has inside of it something that we could conveniently print as plus one two. What if I use syntax E on that? Then it just pulls the S expression this out, but only by one level. So this was a syntax object representing a, a list of syntax objects. And syntax E gave me the list back, the raw list back. I threw away the source location and other information for the output. And then I could take the first of that, so I take that, and the first of that, and I get the syntax object for plus, and I could use syntax E to pull the symbol out. Okay? So you can see the use, one part of this layer is, uh, is about source locations. And of course we want uh, error, errors reporting. In terms of, um, you know, when we're doing macros and there's a syntax error, we want to get pink highlights in the right places. That's the source location connection. Um, and just like we had back quotes and unquote for S expressions, for lists of symbols and numbers, we have hash back quotes and hash unquotes. Right? And you can see that I got a syntax object, but I escaped to compute 3 plus 4, and that got turned back into a syntax object embedded here. And you know the seven. It turns out that the source location of this hash kind of thing. Um, so we have a way of conveniently building these up, just like we do for S expressions. So here is a. Um, I'm going to draw boxes for just a, a few more slides, and then we'll go back over to the uh, Dr. Beckett. This is illustrating a module. Uh, what happens when I evaluate this? When I run this program. Now is uh, just a variable that's bound to current seconds, and then we print oh, it's been that many seconds since 1971 or so. If I sleep for a second and do now again, what do we see? Two different numbers of the same number. Same, obviously, right? Let's suppose I want now to be uh, to always be the current seconds at the time you get there, but I just want to write it as now. How can I do that? I extend the language somehow. And I make now a macro. So now is going to be a macro where it takes some representation of the use, which I don't really care about, and it produces the syntax object called the function current seconds. See what's going on here? So define syntax says it's a compile time binding. The function takes a representation of the use of now and gives me back a syntax object for which to go in place of that use. So what am I going to see when I write it this time? Now we'll see separated by a second, right? Because I slept for a second. Um, what if I just did this? That would be the time at which I was expanding the macro. Uh, yeah, here we go. So I'll call it then instead. And if I sleep for one second and look at then again, uh, even though it's a compile thing, I didn't expand to an expression that's the current seconds, I just returned a number. Actually, I can't return a number. Uh, it says the then macro is supposed to return syntax if you turn a number. So I do this weird thing where I make a template, <laughs> but then I escape right away. And that basically is a coercion in the syntax objects. But then it works. And then we see, that we see the same number. If I sort of compile this program and run it over a year, it'll still keep running the same time because uh, compile it just works. Okay, so you see there's a couple of times going on. You see there's these things called syntax objects. And um, yeah, we'll leave it actually, I'm going to say one more thing. I used hash link racket at the top, as we have all evening. I could often, when I'm writing libraries, I use the smallest language possible, right? so I don't pull in extra dependencies. That's called racket base. Uh, and racket base has things like all the things you would expect, like I can make then as a function, well, then as current seconds. This thing is just commenting out the, the then definition. Okay, so then isn't doing then yet. 
in that case, well, I forgot. I forgot to use lambda in my example. But if I use lambda at one time, it's there. Lambda is not at compile time. So the language that I use at compile time is a completely separate run of the interpreter or the compiler. They may look the same, but in principle, they can be different. And in particular, I may want different facilities at runtime than I want at compile time. So in this case, I need to require for syntax bracket base. And the for syntax says, you know, you're normally pulling in this module, but now shift it into compile time. Pull it in at compile time instead of bracket. So it's a modifier on the import. And now lambda, which comes from bracket base, is available at compile time. Okay. I'll show you that mainly because we're going to use some other libraries at compile time. There have been very few questions so far. Any questions? Why would you want to do that? It seems like it would add a lot of complexity. Why would I want to separate out the phases? Yeah. Well, it's suppose that my program, when it runs, it needs a graphical interface. Um, but I want to compile it on a headless machine. See? Then I want to be clear that at compile time, I don't need the GUI. Or maybe my macros our whole compilers and rearrange the code, and I don't need all of that rearranging machinery when I run the program. So by being explicit about which part is for compile time and runtime, then I get much more control to talk about dependencies. Um, sometimes, not very often, but sometimes I even want a different lambda at compile time than I want at runtime. Different semantics. But that's very similar to what Maven does. Okay. Yeah, Maven says, you know, this is compile time dependency, this is a test dependency, this is a small right. Like that. Right. And we build it into the language in a way that's like a whole other talk that I'm not talking about. But that's the really cool part as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm teaching you to get into the cool part. Uh, good. Great question. Any other? All right. So what were we doing? So this div form needs to use syntax E and first and second and pull apart things and make sure that the div that comes in is right. Uh, you can see the function. Probably it was web tedious here. This is what it would look like. So I get a syntax object and I set myself up with a function that can complain when I find a mistake. Um, I do a syntax E on the main thing. Is that a list? If not, then it's bad syntax. Why wouldn't it be a list? You just type div by itself. Not in front of it, not after print. Uh, does the list have three parts? If not, complain. Okay, now I'll pull the second part up because you know it has at least three. Um, is that a list, right? That's supposed to be like right here. You can't see the gray. I can fix that. Yeah, I can. Who doesn't? <coughs> uh, yeah, I can right, so this is that list here. It's got to be a length of one. And this thing has to be a length, list of length two. And finally, we can check style. So if I misspell it now, then this macro can complain, and it just paints the whole thing pink and says, bad syntax. Okay. Now, I think I've given you the impression that I don't really want to write this all the time. Div was particularly simple. Uh, so what I need is, um, I need some functions to help me do the right checking of the shape. Even better, I need some syntactic forms, some extensions to my language that let me write these kinds of things in a convenient way. So we're going to use one of those. Um, it's called syntax parse from the syntax slash parse library. Now I'm using this library in a macro, so of course I need to say for syntax. That's the whole point of that aside. Now what syntax parse does, it's kind of like match, but for syntax objects. So I give it the syntax object that I'm matching on. I say, can you match it against div? style, um, and then there's some string expression there, right? And then content expression. If you can, then I want to produce almost the same thing, but inserting that quote at the beginning, and unquotes before each of the expression positions. Okay. That is my view of what I want. I need to put a hash quote at the beginning. so. There's kind of an implicit hash quote on the pattern part. And I, I put an explicit hash quote to say I'm returning this syntax object as a result. Now, this syntax object is not going to be literally this syntax object because hash code actually conspires with syntax parse in a few other forms. 
whatever matches in this position. Um, when I use that same name here, it just uh, you know, gets copied over. Right? I'm using the, the pattern variable. Okay, so we do that. And I finally have a div. And when I run this, something I haven't messed something up. Okay, it works as we expect, but uh, it's supposed to check whether I got this in there. What if I make a mistake? I leave out the set of parentheses. Then it'll complain about it. Okay, and let's see what's going on. How come you need the hash comma when you're uh, unescaping S expression and content expression? Uh, so why do they need hash comma earlier and not here? Yeah. So this is the potentially confusing thing about this example that I struggled with all day. I'm using like two layers of quoting and, and unquoting. I want to produce an expression that has back quote and unquote. But at the same time, I'm quoting that whole thing at the syntax level. So this is a syntax quote of that runtime quote. And it turns out that uh, I don't need any hash commas because I'm using the pattern matcher instead. Okay. When we did it the tedious way, there was um, lots more uh, line delays, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I have hash backquote, backquote, and then a hash comma to, to pull that out. And so so quasi-quoting is great, but it has its limits. Um, make sense? Yeah. Right. <coughs> well, this catch the case where you misspelled style. Uh, yeah, I was going to gloss over that because we'll get to it. But no it won't, and why will it not catch it? Because those are just because, the same, but because style just is a pattern variable just like S expert and so on. So I could do something to catch that, but I'm gonna do it in a more general way as we go. So I'm gonna come back to that. Oh, I don't know. Let's 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 do it. So I'm gonna use the pattern variable attribute. So before this between you know, this is a pattern, and then this is our result expression, but actually I can put any number of expressions here. So what I want to do is make sure that attribute, whatever matched attribute, was actually the symbol style, right, or the identifier style, identifier being the syntax object form of that symbol. So what I want to put here is, uh, unless that thing is the right symbol, then um, here is a syntax error saying uh, bad attributes. So a syntax error, it turns out, takes various arguments that are convenient but hard to explain. Uh, <laughs> you always put false, basically, because that's the right thing. <laughs> then you put the whole expression that came into your macro, so that that thing can be suitably recognized. But then this dot 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 is where I'm going to put more specifically which piece of that went wrong. So which piece of it went wrong if we get here? Attribute. It's attribute. Can I just write attribute like this? No, because it's a pattern variable from the syntax object world. So I need to use hash quote here to get to the right thing. So I can use hash quote as many times as I want to pull out different pieces and multiply reuse pieces of the, of the overall thing. Or build up little fragments that I chain together or throw away or whatever. So that also tells us what to do here. It's something about hash quote attribute. But I want to find out if that's equal to Symbol style, it's not quite right. I don't want it to be exactly equal to this syntax object because I don't care if the source locations are different. So the way I'll write it is this way. Is the style symbol equal to the syntax E metric? Right? Right. Sorry? Right. Ray syntax error. Okay, so there we go. We got a very specific error. I like because it's right, right there. And sort of the, uh, the default uh, highlighting doesn't pay attention to the larger source since it has a more specific source. So, are you with me? We're doing a kind of crazy thing here. We're writing arbitrary racket code at compile time. Can this go wrong? What if you write it infinitely? And your compile takes a very long time. Can <laughs> uh, you use a debugger? What kind of debuggers do you have? Well, there's this macro stepper. Right? This is the regular stepper. This is the macro step. It does similar things, but at compile time. 
Uh, but, you know, I don't think mistakes are my signature, so I'll just... <laughs> 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 yeah. All right, so, now, as long as my web page is about this sophisticated, I have a great language for checking it. But what if I want the hyperlink? Now you already know I'm not on the network, so that's the point, but... <laughs> <laughs> what's going to happen at this point? When I try to run this... You can see what it's supposed to be. Right? It's supposed to be building up the uh, HTML that's a div with an A inside, with this attribute to that uh, delightful web page. <laughs> But A is not defined anywhere. So yeah, that's what it's saying you ran the button. What do I want A to be? I want it very much like this, right? And, um, it's called A, and it matches an A and some attributes. And the content, the attribute needs to be href, though. And uh, let's see, I want to produce an A with that attribute. And so How's that? You're not cringing as much as I want you to. Copy the face of the curve. Let's see if it's at least runs. Okay, yeah, it's a hyperlink. It'll tell me that I'm not going to. Oh, it's cached, of course. Suppose some of these that I don't get to be true. So you don't like I copy and paste this, I hope. And you can tell I'm going to do this a bunch. Uh, so what I really want is to write something like. Um, Define tag div, which allows styles, and then define tag a, which allows an href. Then I should because those are the only two things that we do. Do you have an href? So we need a macro. So yes. So with the when you're generalizing uh, a trib and style, and that was a problem before, uh, why doesn't the same thing happen with div? Like why? Why is div specific there, but we had to change style to a trip, like with pattern matching style. But div just works, or is it the same similar, similar problem? I'm not sure I understood. So the macro position, the first element of the pattern is div. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a pattern variable. Well, it turns out it's always going to be div because that's how I got here. So I always know it was div. And I'm just throwing it in there because it makes it slightly more readable. But I could put anything. And often people will put an underscore, which is a wild card, um, to mean don't bother matching because I know what it is. Okay. Okay. But uh, my goal now is not to write it this way, but to write it this way. Um, so this is the same kind of thing I want to do, except it's a uh, define tag. takes a syntax object and does parse of that, where I'm expecting to see define tag, and some tag, and some attribute name, the one that's OK. OK? So if I see this pattern, what code do I want to produce? Basically this code, except instead of div, it's going to be whatever tag is specified. <coughs> those up. And what I need to check for is uh, OK entry. Question? Okay, is there any way that we can reduce this stair case that's building down across the screen? Yeah, there are different ways, but it's not so bad. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For our purposes of just understanding the, the layers and so on, it's better to nest it so that you see it totally nested. Okay. okay, so I'm going to just comment this one out. And uh, I don't know, I might have made a mistake this right out. I got to stop it. Okay. okay, there we go. So it's working. And if I misspell something, so let's make it HRF. Exclamation marks, then it'll complain about that specific part, and so on. What if I, uh, what 
what did I put two strings here? I did this kind of thing early on, right? It just concatenated them for me. What's going to happen right now? You can uh, see unexpected term world. Why? Because you only have room for one. Because my pattern way down in here says there's one content expression. Uh, let's go back to the original for a second because it'll be easier to see what I'm changing. So I want to allow any number of content expressions. Okay, so well, it turns out there's this whole sub-language here. Dot, dot, dot means any number of repetitions of the previous thing. So the pattern variable content expert now stands for multi mini matches. And so I have to put dot, dot, dot after its use also. Okay, so that's better. And it works out now. And then what happens when I take this take this improvement and put it up here? I always wonder whether I should really talk about this, but I can't really <laughs> need it to get to the next thing. It's gonna go wrong. No pattern variable before ellipses and template it on that dot, which is this one. Sure, that's a pattern variable. Or this syntax parse. But this syntax parse is the one that's complaining. So because I had this nesting, I need to escape my dot dot dots so that they get passed through the next level. The syntax possibly could be worse, but probably not. We <laughs> <laughs> escaped it by putting dot dot dots in front of it. <laughs> I didn't pick this, but someone very cleverly noticed that open print dot 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 wouldn't mean anything otherwise, so they can take it with me. <laughs> I think it was actually named after the register on the machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why why did I pull in dot dot dot? It's because I want to draw these styles on my uh, on my A's as well as hrefs, and uh, I want any number of those. And so <laughs> what I really want to do is allow uh, any number of attributes there. No, sorry, let's not say there. So now I have any number of okay attributes. And I need to make sure that this name is not just equal to the only one, but is among the set of the good ones. So we can use the member function on that and the list of OK entries. Is this dot 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 right? Yes, because it's the elder syntax parse that it needs to refer to. Um, and then I want to allow any number of these. Okay, so that one needs to be escaped. And then I need to make sure that all of those are OK. So, uh, so we're going to have repetitions of these escaped. But that's a list now. So what I need to do is uh, or map a function that takes just one of them. Yeah, I'll get to the question in just a minute. And make sure that each one of them is in there. Except it's a syntax object. <laughs> so you might think, gee, this is kind of complicated, but I'm extending my language with this much code. It does take some practice to get used to. There's kind of functional programming, and then there's some macro programming. It's a whole lot of work. But you can see it's building on all that functional stuff. I'm using format right away in my first 10 line example. Um, all right. Is it common to have a macro, define a macro? Macro generating macros? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. It's actually pretty common. Okay. Um, because everything is a macro. Like, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> it's just uh, all the systems put together. So I've gotten something wrong. Let me, uh, let me run it to see which dot 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 is wrong. So you, can, you notice, hey, you're using attrib here, and attrib is matched to a sequence of things at some level. So that needs some dot dot dots after. Yeah. And, oh, look, there's another one, because that was supposed to be inside. Uh, let's just not complain specifically. We could fix that up by moving it inside the or map, but I think you get the idea. So if you were going to pull an inception and do one more macro inside this, would you need to escape the, the dot, dot, dots twice? Yeah, that does not happen very often. Okay. Uh, we start sort of moving it or using different tools uh, when that happens. So 
what, what most likely would happen is you would defer to the helper macro that be shifted back up to the front, just like you don't keep nesting functions, you defer to the helper. Sure. Okay. Yep. Uh, sorry, where, did, where was it complaining about? Okay, so go back to where we were. Okay. Uh, so I can do href and I can do a style like if I want this part to be on the way old now. And then I can add some more stuff after the div, after the A, which is uh, something like that. So it's all fitting together now. Uh, this also resolves even with divs. I might not want to put a style there, so now you can put an empty thing because dot 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 says zero or more. So this is all great. My next complaint would be I have this big program. So I'm going to end up having a bunch of tags. We'll get rid of this now. Uh, I will want, have a bunch of tags for I don't know what else is an HTML table, TD and TR, and all these, all those things. Um, and then I got the program after that. I want to break these up. Right? I want to make my HTML formatting library once and make lots of web page one, or lots of websites one. So what I want to do now is leave that piece but pull this piece out into a different module. So um, this piece right here, I'm going to put somewhere else. Um, so we're going to flip it around, actually. I'll say define go, or I'll give it the content for the whole page. Right, let's call it page. And then I'll provide the page function to some other module. So now in another module, I'm going to put this. Right? Uh, but then that other module is also going to need to see uh, div and a and anything else. I mean, all of them actually. It's kind of tedious that I wrote all these defined tags and then I write provide with the same name every time. So, I don't know, while we're at it, let's make our macro. It defines this macro. Let's have it do two things do that and also provide it. Okay, so when I do define tag, it's really define and provide tag. So, yeah. I told you this was going to be kind of seat of the pants, so I just threw that out. <laughs> Okay, let's call this web racket, and now um, I have a new page racket which requires web racket. Page racket. So now I can write these different sites all in these different places. There was nothing surprising about this, I hope, right? Just, just regular module stuff, right? Move stuff, export findings, <coughs> their macros, they're expanding to stuff. Uh, let's see, I'll reopen that in a tab. Well, our macro, let's see here. This is, uh, I'm going to change this so it calls show and what this will do is every time I use one of these tags, it's for debugging and print out the result. Um, which is just going to be this find show v function. Show v or print v. That's my other favorite programming language to see. <laughs> so, okay. So now when I Now when I run my website and it gets a page gets requested, you see I get these printouts. The point of this little diversion was I can't use show in here. And show is not exported. I'm going to get an error about no show. Even though this div macro is expanding to a use of show. So how can that possibly work? It's not S expressions, it's syntax object. So in addition to the source location, the uh, syntax object is carrying with it its lexical context. It knows where it came from, and so it knows show means the, the thing that's over here. 
you know, you can imagine that at the module level, this is done with something like um, keywords or those kinds of, I forget the terminology in, in common list. Um, but actually, it's a more general kind of thing uh, with keeping the lexical context so that it's sort of you can keep nesting things. So that's another whole talk probably, about making macros sensitive to lexical script. But it, it works out the way you're supposed to. The big picture is you just put things into a different module. It's fine. We'll provide the bindings when you see. I might want to go further. Um, like I might want to simplify and say uh, just use the web language and write this stuff. And if it needs to be set to a page function, then we can do that. So now I'm making an even more customized language. You can see it's not working yet. There's some red at the top. I have to say, for the way I'm writing it at the moment, that it's going to be using S expression notation and then import everything from web. And now it's not going to work for another reason, which is I was relying on a bunch of bracket stuff that just came with it. So now I need to change web to not only provide all the things it was providing, but also all from else record. So I'm just re-providing everything from record. But if I don't want you to use some things from record, then I could leave them out right? uh, and give a more restricted language. Because the only things I can get to here are with this language set I, I have available. So now this can work, except it doesn't start a web page because this is just a top level expression that produced that S expression. So what I really want is to treat the body specially. I want to wrap it in a column page. How would you do that? Um, well, it turns out that when you have a page like this, it's implicitly wrapped with hash percent module begin. And hash percent is intentionally ugly. It's a name that's introduced um, sort of implicitly for you. So, um, even though it's an ugly name, it's a, na a name you can find. So what I can do is not provide the hash percent module begin for bracket, but uh, provide my own module begin. So here, I'm going to call it module begin without the hash percent. But I export the thing that means module begin here as hash percent module begin. And that module begin is a macro. It takes the syntax object, and it is, you know, I'll just use an underscore module begin, and then some expression, which I want to change to call page on that expression. Except, uh, and then once I put it in page, then I go back to rackets module begin. Cool. That's going to be a hash clip. Right. So 100% module begin is slightly special. There are a few things in bracket syntax that are implicit. And when you use a function name like f, that's explicit. Right? When you say open parent f, you're applying a function. But if you want to change what function application means, there's actually a hash percent f that you can change. Another implicit one is when you write the number one, that's a literal. Well, there's an implicit form you could change to change the meaning of literals. And your module begin is the one that's implicitly wrapped in the whole module. Once we do that, then I have this even more streamlined language. But, uh, but, uh, I didn't get something right over here. Macro definition. Oh, this should be module begin. Because I shadowed the other one. Okay. okay, so that's okay now. Okay, so in the record world, we keep pushing on this. We change the syntax. Uh, we even move away from parentheses. We have ways of making this shorter, so you could just have the web language, and it could, its syntax could be more like this div or something to make it easier to write literals that have commas in them and so on. Right? So I'm not going to keep talking about that, but if you're interested, I can point you to some explanations of that kind of thing. What I was trying to do today is not so much turn you into language implementers. But make you think a little bit like a language implementer. Function, functional programming, functional languages, give you lots of abstraction power uh, through first you know, higher order functions. And we try to make everything higher order. 
But then eventually, when you need to streamline the notation, then you, you move into sort of syntactic abstraction. Abstractions over syntax as well as over different kinds of values. Right? And then you sort of turn the knob up on syntactic abstraction to syntactic extension, which is taking your language and, and having things into replacing. You turn the knob up further and you make your own new, new languages where you use check things and so on. So uh, that is just taking us back to the very beginning. Why Jay said at the beginning you have to say hashlang racket. That's just one of many records. So I'll stop here and take more questions. Uh, So again, going back to, like I said, like the staircase thing, you said yeah. there are other tools that you can do with that. I'm looking at that, I'm thinking there's so many levels of escape that I'm feeling a little stymied. I, I really like what's happening conceptually. Yeah. There are, you can reassure me that there are tools to. So what I would probably do here is. Um, What would I do in this case? Start using eval and something. Yeah, eval you know, is not going to get you anywhere in this, in this world. Okay. <laughs> eval is, so, is, is <laughs> I, I sort of sidestep the issue, but Racket goes, sort of makes it, helps you use eval properly, which to a first approximation means it doesn't work for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to go on to say what you really meant by eval. Uh, why does this not show up? What would I do? I feel like I should have a helper back there that would somehow take care of this. But I don't see yeah. exactly how it would work here. Somehow you would like pass it in and say, okay, here's my structure. Do everything. I don't yeah, have to yeah. escaping anything a second time. Yeah, you something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on this particular example? Yeah, I thought actually when you were doing it before that uh, you were going to use a uh, syntax box. Ah, yes. For the attributes? Yeah, syntax parse is way more powerful than I'm using here. Okay. Um, for example, right now, you could pass a number as an OK attribute. Okay. Uh, and then weird things would happen. Okay. But in syntax parse, I can put keyword, colon, keyword after that, okay. which constrains it syntactically to be a keyword. So there's a lot of built in checking. Um, so, in fact, uh, I wouldn't write anything like this using syntax parse more properly. I would have attrib. Being a, a, the div, the div attribute class somehow. Okay. So we lift that checking out and get better error messages as a result. Um, so I know, I know it's all very meta, right? I keep motivating language design because I need a better language for parsing things so I can do language design. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you're here in a functional programming place, so I assume you're comfortable with that. <laughs> so we, you can. This is a very small example. We have the class, a Java-like class system, which is a giant macro. Um, and it does more than Java because it does two directions of inheritance and things like that. And contract systems, right? Jay alluded to contracts, which are you know, runtime tests. That's more syntax to help you write, um, you know, write those contracts and the way they get attached. And the contract system has a little optimizer in it that rearranges how it writes the contract so that it performs better and all of these sorts of things. So um, I'm just trying to suggest that it really does scale up, even though it might start looking, looking scary. So I, I'm interested in what you just mentioned about the, the way that your, your type racket system and uh, regular racket and module system all interact with one another, and the, the contracts and whatnot. Right. So. Um, when I uh, type drag it, say here's a function, f, and uh, we're going to see how much I use type bracket. <laughs> <laughs> so I say that f has type number, arrow number. Okay, and I think this is going to type check. Yes. Okay. If I try to use f on a string, it doesn't run, it tells me a type number. And then I provide f. So let's call this module F. And now in the racket language, I'm going to require F and call F on a string. And I need to save it in the same directory so it knows where F is relative to this one. And then what I get, it's not going to be a type error because I'm not in a statically typed language. You clearly have done something wrong and I get a runtime error. So this runtime error 
came from the type site. So what type tracking has is a hash percent module begin. It takes the body of the module and type checks it and expands it. And it also changes f. Even though f looks like a function definition, it's actually ends up being bound as a macro. It carries the contract with it. This is why I say everything's a macro, even though you don't know you're writing a macro. Uh, and we could try to look at this. Let's see what happens if I use the macro stuff. Macro stuff will show us the expansion and raw and raw record code for this. Okay. I go to the end. Let me see what happens if I use some macro. Yeah, let me just get back to it. Okay, so this is really what the racket compiler sees. It got changed to this big pile of code. And yeah, so sort of this is the F that actually gets exported. Oh, the colors are the F. Not here. Uh, but this F, you can kind of see make, provide, contract, error, transformer. It means it's making F to be a macro that applies these runtime contracts and so on. Is that the kind of thing you're looking for? Yeah. Too much information? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the time bracket people that write this directly, they use layers of macros. They kind of spend it. This is like looking at assembly code that can spend through the C++ in the same contract that type bracket generates automatically for you, you could have written yourself manually when you're uh, integrating two untyped modules together. Yeah. What type bracket does is it's generating them for you automatically to intermediate those two. Yeah, so from the perspective of untyped code, I wrote the same thing as provide contracts. Yeah. Uh, where the contract is number question mark. The types turn into runtime predicates. So what else can you do with the contract language? What can't you do? Well, <laughs> I, could make it, I could say it has to be even numbers, which is conceivably useful. Um, and you could fit that into a type system, and for all I know, type track it does have even numbers, because it's got a very sophisticated numerical type system, but I don't think even prime is certainly not in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's our standard example. <laughs> when people ask, what can you do that you can't write as a type, we write that contract. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, um, you know, even more interestingly, what if F is supposed to take a function that's supposed to expect a prime number and give me back a string? Uh, then, you know, the, the contracts get pulled along in the right way mm -hmm. so that uh, the right kind of function must be provided. And also, if I provide the wrong kind of function, the right side of the module boundary gets blamed. So are the, the contracts all... Uh, done through the module boundary, or are there contracts within a module for That's a, a interfunction? In practice, they're at the module boundary. Ah. There are scope constraining things that you can, you can uh, use to do it within a module. But we tend to think of them as being on the module boundary. And people are using them extensively inside of a module, probably one at a time, which is what we want. Maybe this was covered earlier, I came in a little bit late, but um, at a much higher level, there are thousands and thousands of lists. Why, why racket? Uh, there are not why any lists that can do this kind of thing. So yeah. the talk I didn't give, you know, in Dr. Racket, we have this notation right, with syntax coloring. And um, this is I'm writing a little text adventure game. Right? So this program turns out to be equivalent to this program. And you can do this in other lists in the same way you can do it in the Turing complete language. So we have a lot of infrastructure where you can plausibly do this kind of thing. And this is kind of a toy example, but, um, you know, where Dr. Racket started from is for teaching, where we have these restricted languages. And having five different languages that students use to make that effective, um, we have to build up all the machinery for that. Uh, that was one reason why. Uh, the other thing is that Racket is about, it's nearing 20 years old. 20 years ago, schemes were not practical, just none of them. Um, and so I, it was started as a practical scheme as well. Dr. Racket is implemented in Racket. You know, this kind of GUI thing is common now, but wasn't so much there. And of course, we kept going and had to base and open GDOM all sorts of So it's a big batteries included, um, along with the new package system. Along those lines, I started a scheme way, way back when, and I noticed that you transitioned to Racket later. What, what made, why did you make that transition? Why did you just change the name? Yeah, yeah, or why, why? Well, it was part, partly about making the language practical. Like keyword arguments. When you do anything at scale, you need 
you like keyword arguments for your functions. And then that, it's sort of, sort of like you can squeeze it in as a library, but you just sort of want it to be there. Um, so Racket became a distinct kind of language in that sense because there was a lot just there. That you could, in principle, do or do a different way, but we didn't want to make it a small language that, in principle, could do lots of things. We wanted to be this language, and we wanted it to be this language for languages, this extensible language. So there are language features. I, so I, I don't know much about the difference between Scheme and Racket. I always thought they were kind of the same, but there are. Definitely. Yeah, my, I mean, obviously, I'm kind of biased in my position, but I, I think the language, yeah. there was this, and then there was Scheme, and then there was Racket. <laughs> okay. Very similar deltas in my mind. And it's because the underlying um, evaluator needed to change, or the syntax needed to change? Some of it is runtime, some of it is syntax, some of it is okay. the syntax extension mechanism. All the above. Uh, okay. And it's not like they're completely disjoint, and some of the Racket technology flowed back into the Scheme world, and our seven standard modules. And so well, Racket is a one list, right? It's a one list, yes. With no schema, it's a ring. It's the same scheme for Racket. But yeah. So, yeah, you can uh, select uh, a couple of the standard uh, schemes from the language menu, right? That's true, also. You yeah. can also select Java. Yeah. <laughs> you can also select Java or Model 60. <laughs> So, what I've noticed that there's a, a PLT Red X yeah. language in there. So that's, that's another language. That's a language, a domain specific language for modeling languages, for, for modeling formal systems, uh, modeling with formal systems. So, a particular style of, of rewriting system. Uh, and we, we use it to write papers, for example, where we need to define our language. But all these languages are implemented in Racket with macros. With macros. So we're very much embracing our Lisp heritage and Scheme heritage, but trying to push it even further. That's what we see ourselves as doing. Uh, I'll go with Simon and then. What are you excited about and exploring in Racket right now? Well, um, well the macro system, I hope I get that across. <laughs> how to explain it, uh, how to push it forward. There are certain parts of this kind of thing that we're falling back to Lex and Yak, and we can do better. Certain parts of the uh, Dr. Racket infrastructure that could be better, more code completion. Um, I work on documentation a lot, systems for writing documentation. Um, uh, so that naturally, there's a language for that that we use quite extensively for <coughs> documentation. And why do you need another language? Because in our documents, you know, it's the 21st century, so if there's some code and it's an identifier, you should be able to go right to it. It shouldn't just be verbatim uh, text with no links. So there's a language that makes it easy to write things so that the links go to the right places. So I'm excited about um, this language extensibility and all that it enables and how we're able to apply it to many parts of our process. I'm convinced that macros is the next big thing, but I've been convinced of that for a decade. <laughs> like, Can you show us the code for your slideshow? The code for the slideshow? Uh -huh. So that was this. I assume you know by now it's all racket programming. <laughs> <laughs> so this one uses the slideshow language. And the edX there, it's not all parentheses, there's some curly braces in there somewhere. So here you see the keyword arguments. And there's a bunch commented out. See, it make you suffer through all that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so if macros are making it so much easier to write you know, language extensions and, and Domain specific languages and whatnot. Who's looking at, at making ways of making macros easier to write so you don't have to escape so much and go through so many mind bending loops? Yeah, yeah, we're certainly doing that. Syntax parse. Syntax parse is a great advance over the, the previous things, hmm. and that's Ryan Culpepper's work. And then we like this too. And you know, I'm interested in looking at the fundamental pieces, the, the syntax objects, the exact way that lexical scope works is kind of subtle and hard to explain. And I think do better and make it more efficient at the same time. So we are, but we of course invite many, you know, we want other people to be excited about this and work in the same area. I'm sure there's lots that can be done to make this language this, uh, easier to write. Yeah. Also, Matthew's examples are uh, written over there to demonstrate what the pieces are. Most macro writers wouldn't use those core pieces directly. They would 
you some of the other pictures and some of the parts. So it's a little bit misleading. Yeah, parts. so... Yeah, let me see. A good example. Right here, when I wrote this, that felt really long. I would normally write define syntax rule. Module begin expert is module begin. So in fact, define syntax rule covers lots of simple macros. It's just building the template and the pattern right there. You didn't need to do any extra checking for whatever reason. Um, so that's much easier to make. In many tutorials, I've tried starting here and generalizing, but for today I was trying to get around. Thank you. Yeah.